Tales of Rainy Ring fans. It's your main man, Master Cell, leader of the Master Knights of the Round Table of Hope you subscribe to the Spin Crew. And literally just woke up, crawled out of bed, came to the TV room, hitting that early morning Saturday cartoons type beat. The bags of my eyes from this morning hasn't even left yet. <laughs> now, you guys know I have not been shy of telling y'all basically how much I have loved this show so far. And to the point where I almost reference this show in all my other reviews as well, especially with Thurston involved. However, there is truly indeed a rare moment or rare occasion where we have a show that has completely perfect episodes. And of course that pertains to the person watching it because that's, you know, a state of preference. But I guess this is just me saying that this is my least favorable episode so far. And to be fair, since we passed the halfway point, the way things are progressing right now in this episode kind of gives us the feel that we're getting into some deeper stuff. And the reason for something like that right now is something that shows also do when it comes to shows like this. Inadvertently focus on other characters. And with this being a harem, I don't mean in a sense of simply just focusing on the different girls. Saito is the ring king, and he's here to collect the rings. That is his whole shtick. That is the reason he is here in the first place. However, it very much felt like the focus of this episode was taken off of him. And not only are we entering a similar situation that we did with the elves when we were first trying to recruit the Fretters, when it comes to the main guy that having the focus put on them about what they're doing in this arc right now, it's really Mars. With that being said, let's get into it. Now we touch down in the Kingdom of Water. Water is something the Fretters still having a problem with. It comes to traveling. Then we go, when we get back to our main world, we go use the light portal. And immediately when we get there, we see everybody standing there and I'm reminded that Grand Art is with us. Not that I forgot, but seeing her standing next to everybody definitely gives us a different feel as a group. Visible representation is a good thing. But when it comes to another thing that makes this episode probably not one of my favorable episodes of Tales of Wedding Rings, it pretty much is because something else that's bound to happen in harems. I have had harems where my favorite girl was simply the OTP, which is something we're having going on right now. However, I there was times where I only cared about that OTP and didn't care about the other girls. And I have to say, that's not what happened here. There's also times like a hundred girlfriends that really, really, really love you, where initially every girl that showed up, I disliked at first. And all of them had to do a 180 of sorts to at least make me care, and I ended up liking all the girls. That's not happening here either in Tales of Ready Rings. I wasn't the biggest fan of <laughs> their friend's first impression, but all of them so far so good, they didn't have any actual issues with them with all these considered. And then, like I said, the thing that's bound to happen. Even if you have girls come in that can't still make a 180 and make you like them, there's that girl in the group that you're not gonna like. And with that being said, when Saito gets there, he's immediately met with the Maiden of Water, Sephir. With a cloak over her head and everything, to take it off the cloak to reveal that she's the one with the horns in the ending. Immediately, beware Saito makes, makes them married, give him the Maiden of Water, and. I guess that's the reason why the focus is kind of off Saito in this episode, because mission accomplished already, right? You know, to be on episode 7, but to have 4 or 5 rings already, reminds you that the true plot is facing the Abyss King. I very much doubt we're going to take 5 episodes getting that fifth ring. Now, once again, getting right into it, why do I initially, at this moment, don't like Sophia? First off, it's indeed personality. Now, if you played Devil's Advocate, there wasn't a threat that she was very shy in the beginning. She was very turned off by the <laughs> concept of kissing. A very nervous girl that kind of threw up when she was in unfamiliar situations and kind of just ran away from her problems. In the background of all that, there was ended problems with the elf city of the wind, and she had an older brother that was very protective for keeping her down in the first place. Her personality was kind of warped by the politics going on. And in the grand scheme of things, you can kind of say the same for Sophia the more you look into it. However, they simply don't feel the same. The Fretters was kept caught in a bubble the whole time, and despite her bossing up and making her own decisions at the end of the day to break out of that, all she really needed was a change of scenery, as you see what's going on with her now in later episodes. That just pissed off some fear fans, but if I can say it one time, her personality began this episode simply just came up as a bitch. This girl immediately was like, I heard the rumors. This man's a fool. You know, outright coming here, this man is like, uh huh. And they did some backwards shit. Immediately comes in there and wears Saito. Just be like, you know, I don't actually care. So, you know, if you girls want to fight over him, you go, oh, go ahead and do that. I'm just going to do this. Literally backwards from the Fretis and Grand Art. Sancho has 10 years invested with Hime. He had to earn the Fretis trust. He had to own Grand Art's hands. There was no work necessary to get to Severe. So when it comes to her actually ending up liking him at some point, 
if it does happen, it kind of just be like, why? And if it never never happened, honestly, that would make more sense. But kind of goes against what we're doing here. I mean, pulling this car before it got me in some hot water earlier this season. I'm gonna do it again here. Obviously, this girl isn't human. Hell, she got horns coming out of her head. And with Grand Art being a cat woman and the Fructus being an elf, with this girl being a, I don't want to say demon, but it's easy to assume that at some point in the next coming episodes, they're gonna say that she's at some <laughs> huge age that's outside of Saito's range. Second episode of Grand Art, we realized she was 18. Second episode with the Fructus, we realized she was 54. So I guess we're gonna hear from Seth for the next week. And true indeed, Saito and Hime's ages were never actually specified. Which may be a good time to say though, I actually have started to dive into the manga a little bit of Tales of Wedding Rings. I'm not caught up to where the show is right now, but I'm checking things out. A little bit more on that later. He may call himself an adult right in the beginning. That's what she said. To be fair. They gave me third year of high, of high school energy, so I'm pulling the same card that I played with you, Keith, and <laughs> Chain Soldier. I understand it's a reach to my own benefit, but kiss my ass. But if I can cancel myself right quick by body shaming, this girl does not look like <laughs> her height barely comes up to Saito's chest. Speaking of chefs, where is hers? Leave me alone. By anime standards, she does not look <laughs> like she's... It's just kind of too big to be a lolly, so that doesn't look like that's what we're going for either. Guys, the change of pace is necessary. We know all body types aren't the same, especially when it comes to IRL. So if anime wants to kind of put some difference in front of you, and all things considered, you kind of have to respect it. But when you're the one girl outside the fact that you're a twin, <laughs> Looking like this, in a show where we have a lot of, let's be real, bodacious women. You haven't seen a small set of tendons until she showed up. Sophia just feels out of place. Like, from the way she marries Saito, from the way she acts, from the way she looks, and... Actually, besides the plot. As long as when you pull all that away with Sophia, we actually get into what's going on with the Kingdom of Water here. It's actually the deepest plot we had so far in Tales of Wedding Rings. It's one thing to have your kingdom ran by overprotective brother. It's another thing to have straight up corruption between the royals. Especially when you have a city here, Masa, not to be confused with Masa but fully coolly. This is two A's. Directly being linked with the evil empire. Especially with family ties making worse because the one of the head guys in charge around here, kind of the general kind of thing walking around just so happens to be Marcy's brother. Can kind of see the resemblance, but they kind of went out their way again with character design here to make him look like the older brother, if you know what I'm saying. They're gonna take their armor off. Ain't that damn big. Before we get ahead of ourselves, though, there is a moment where Sophia tells Saito that this land they're in right now, the Kingdom of Water, is under great peril. And it's been predicted that this kingdom's gonna fall. And they're typically under attack by monsters, not even like straight up abyss monsters, just like. There's this huge octopus thing that's about to attack while they're going through the city. This travel through the city where Nefretis is under a sheet the entire time. Another problem with Sephiroth being personality wise, she doesn't exactly respect the other wives. And particularly pointing out that Grand Art is a cat and calls her a filthy animal. This home alone, what's going on here? Grand Art wants to beat that ass, but he may stop her. More on that later. But when a monster or octopus kind of thing kind of attacks, Saito goes straight into action, activating the ring, ring of fire and the ring of light, basically burning it and blocking it back, then cutting it in half with a sword, light sword. This man Saito is about to be a Yu-Gi-Oh monster soon enough. And this is very impressive for everybody here, because typically when stuff like this happens, everything goes downhill. <laughs> Saito swiftly handles it, and yeah, ring king, bitch. Who y'all doubting out here? Bruh, this man got half a series of clout already. But it's then when we meet, the king around here. And the king around here is indeed Sephir's dad. There's always gotta be some relation, right? He made his uncle the Fructus brother, Sephir's dad. Shout out to Grand Art for just being a damn. <laughs> that would mean that the traveling kingdom of fire were just left completely unattended just now. Then Hmm. Now upon this we meet the Oracle. Are the Oracle Ages or the Oracle of Seasons? Making Zelda references has not been hard in the show. This Oracle, this lady, this Big purple lip lady under this big purple hood hiding her face, but just, you can still kind of tell she looks old. This isn't no elder elf situation, like lady, get out of here. <laughs> and what is believed to be going on here, at least by Sophia, is that this oracle is puppeteering this royal kingdom right there, especially her elderly father, who used to be a man to revere and respect, but ever since the oracle showed up, he kind of just started to wither away and become completely reliant on the oracle. And as Sapphire believes, which we come to find is true. This oracle was sent by the evil empire, basically to see through the downfall of Masa, as well as the ring king, yeah, Saito. Before we get ahead of ourselves again, we come, <laughs> we come to find that Saito is indeed a twin, a twin sister, 
Sephir. Look how lazy name it was that. You're Sephir. You're Sephir, yeah. But I've been like, and you're John. And you're John then. You're a Christian. But you're Christina. You're Mike. But you're Michael. You're Michelangelo. Triplets. Freaking dumb. However, apparently we in an interesting situation because them two being twins, either one of them could have been the pretty much the princess of the water ring. I don't know why I butchered my words just now. Hey, Mr. Sophia, being a bitch, went into business for herself and kind of just put Mary Saito on her own without consulting her sister. And that's something to point out though because apparently there's a difference in personalities between these two almost night and day. She comes down right down the stairs seeing the sisters seem very concerning despite them very much looking alike, you know, face, body, wise, horns and all that besides their eyes. Until she takes a look at Saito and calls him such a plain, ordinary, uninteresting man and... The one thing Sophia didn't do was straight up judge a book by its cover. I don't know if I ever use this word on YouTube. Ever. But it's one thing for Sophia to be a bitch. It's another thing for Sophia to be a judgmental cunt. Even I have to stand here and admit it and be like, hey, Saito, you married the right one. Or she married you, but you know what I'm saying. And unfortunately, Saito's wives don't do too well in defending him. Besides Hime. Hime was almost non-existent in this entire episode, but she had one moment that made it shine more than anything, which once again reminds us what the OTP is. Hime, no matter what ends up happening, your spot is solidified in this show in my book. As first in line. She, she is in line, if you ask me. But it's at this point where we find out about Mars. Now, when it comes to Mars, apparently he had made a big promise to Sephiria. And as we go back to episode one, we are reminded that he was the original man that was supposed to become the Ring King. But Sephiria, disappointed, Mars said she doesn't even want to hear him anymore and just starts to run off. The first his vibes in the beginning. And we were eventually told by Sephiria that Mars and Sephiria love each other. And with Mars becoming supposed to be the Ring King, he was supposed to end up eventually marrying the Maiden of Water, which apparently in this case was going to end up being Sephiria. Which doesn't take away any of the reasons I don't like Sophia, but it does kind of lighten up the initial moment in this episode when she immediately made Saito. Because with Mars well, supposed to be the Ring King, but instead the Ring King became Saito right at that very moment, which everybody here knows about. Yeah, there was no way Sophia was going to marry for Saito. Matter of fact, it would have been the worst rejection in this show so far when it comes to the initial contact with these wives. So I guess considering I'll give you all a pass for that. And there's another thing, apparently Mars and Sephiria had a lot of history and the main promise that was put here was Mars was supposed to take Sephiria out of here. She wants to leave this kingdom, all this considering what we're learning about this kingdom, can't blame her. And the cop out, honestly, <laughs> just being real with it, was Mars just becoming the Ring King and doing his duty as the Ring King and taking all his wives and putting them on this journey to meet the Abyss tonight and she was kind of just going to take off on the ride. Now truth be told, the whole time I was getting into this, I was kind of just like, He's not the Ring King. So what? Yes, if he can't use the power of the ring, he can't just use that as an excuse to take you on a journey. But Saito has been in two situations already where being, walking in as the Ring King didn't mean you could change the, the kingdom's politics. Mars being the Ring King would not have guaranteed you a ticket out of here. Also, doesn't this mean that Mars doesn't have to marry for other woman now? So if you guys are truly in love anyways, you can go ahead and just get hitched. Can I just figure it out from there? Like Saito's been doing this whole show? Damn. I do like Sophia better than Sophia. Now with Marsh, there is one last thing. Apparently, he's kind of been a spy this whole time. And I don't want to just put that on him because who Marsh has been this entire time. And we know his true intentions. We know how he truly feels about everybody. And we know he's still, at his core, that good boy character. But just by simply being a part of this team, because he was initially supposed to be the leader of this team, he has been given information to his brother, given information invertedly to quote unquote evil empire. And again, as Sophia was right about the Oracle plotting against the whole kingdom and the Ring King, she is pretty, the Oracle pretty much put a hit on Saito saying that he needs to die. Kill the King of Rings, kill the Ring King. And after more than a handful of failed attempts of doing so by normal regular humans as Grand Art is able to tell because he's pretty much been playing bodyguard. At the end of this episode, Mars is straight up approached by the Oracle, who he already knows very well, so he knows as well that like that's fear is correct. And she straight up says in three days a big attack is gonna happen, and that is the moment where Mars has to kill the Ring King. Now this is kind of going down as kinda of cliche, because you know 
It's easy to just predict that Mars is going to do that. However, like I was alluding to earlier, Mars kind of taking the taking the focus of this episode, at least the male lead of this episode, other than Saito. And with Saphir immediately taking herself out of the whole, does he, he has to, you know, be wed this woman, he has to get this woman on his side, on his side, blah, blah, blah. Saito doesn't have to have those problems right now. Mars is pretty much taking the lead of this, and his big decisions later on in next week's episode is going to be a turning point in the show. There been moves and proclamations that we have yet to see at least so far in this show. And that's the episode. Now, you may have noticed, since you made it this far into this video, that I did not at all talk about the fan service. First of all, the reason for that is this video is already 15 minutes, and I had a lot to go over when it comes to Saphir. And the current conflict that we're on has a lot of intricate and moving parts in it, so there was a lot to cover there that we typically don't cover in Tales of Red Rings episodes. Yeah, in hindsight, this episode hit you for a lot at once. And by Tales of Red and Ring standard, the fan service at this episode was very minimal. However, the state face, I will shout out that one scene where Saito, Nefertis, and Hime were sleeping together. Not sex, you bastard. My grandma was out there staying watch, beating up people trying to get in there. Nobody's always watching when Saito's in bed. There's some sleepwear, damn they're called sexy lingerie going on there. These girls, damn they're half naked, naked on top of Sir Saito. <laughs> They man, it's a good at night, y'all. They earned it. Then there was the sunbathing where they had the swimsuits going on. We come to find out in their own way, all these girls is afraid of water. <laughs> and the Fritz is in the swimsuit outside of seeing her naked. That's the most skin she's ever seen. They had Grandma in the red swimsuit, and despite that being sexy, outside of her normal attire, that's the most she's ever been covered up. How about Yoko moment there? Grandma, the swimsuit is sexy, but I can't see your ass right now. Can you, uh... Change back. And yes, he was wearing a white bikini her damn self, but with her having the most fan service and most nudity in the show so far, that kind of just felt like a cop out as well. <laughs> like I said, this was the least fan service in the show so far. This has been 17 minutes. See why I didn't want to talk about the fan service. Make this video unnecessarily longer for nothing. I guess if we all have to talk about Sophia, she came out there in the most skimpy black bikini of all. But very much confirmed that petite body I was talking about earlier. Talk about she typically bathes and they get me, you guys are here. Nah, that's not an excuse. We're past that woman. We're gonna see the nips at some point. It's Tales of Wedding Rings. And with that, let me get out of here. If y'all watch this video, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Like this video, and I'll see y'all. Peace out. Subscribe to the spin move. I could talk about it again, Grandma trying to make babies with Saito.